So now that we've got a strong grasp as to how we've developed phylogenies over time and what phylogenetic trees are all about and this idea of looking at the power and the influence of evolutionary history all around us, we're going to take this knowledge and start to interpret things. When we see a phylogenetic tree, when we see relationships, we're going to need to interpret those relationships. And that's what the next two flowcharts are going to be about. Interpreting relationships. And we're talking about evolutionary relationships, specifically um, Roman numeral one. When we want to look at an evolutionary relationship, let's say if a systematist, that's the person who studies the idea of systematics, um, systematists, it's very hard to say, systematists, they're going to first and foremost uh, have to start somewhere when they want to look at an evolutionary relationship. They have to first start and examine uh, on a broad scale, and they first examine uh, the largest group that they can possibly find, the largest group of organisms being studied. So they start off big, and in this big start off, they're going to start working their way more and more specific to start the interpretation. So a systematist is somebody who studies systematics, and they first examine the largest group of organisms being studied. And so what they do is, once they look at this large group, they're going to examine a couple of things specifically. They specifically examine common characters. So this is the idea of looking at those characteristics. So we'll say common characteristics. Um, examine common characteristics of all within group. So what does everybody share? So that I can have a baseline as to start to uh, work off of, uh, that I can work off of, that I can start looking at differences. And you start looking at differences when you think of Darwin's idea of descent with modification. So systematists will look at all of the similarities and then based off of those similarities start seeing differences, start seeing modification and descent with modification nonetheless. Specifically, we can say that in this study, in this interpretation, you start to look for and see that organisms share some characteristics, okay, this is a fact, that we know because this is the you know commonality that all of life has that we all share some characteristics with each other um, and that specifically sh that sharing of some characteristics is with a common ancestor but sometimes we see divergence we see modification and sometimes we differ in others let's say differ in other characteristics so we share some characteristics with common ancestor and differ in others so this is how we're going to work off of our interpretation. We're going to look at this idea of descent with modification, see that there are, of course, similarities, but then there are, of course, differences that we can start to look at. And those differences can be classified in one of two ways. One way we can understand a difference is to look at it as a shared ancestral characteristic. Okay? And when we want to look at this difference or maybe even this similarity, we have to look at the ancestor specifically, thus the name. So this is called a shared ancestral characteristics. Let me rewrite characteristics. Characteristics. So keyword here is ancestral, and the other one will go uh, right after this. In a shared ancestral characteristic, we are going to be looking at the following. These are going to be features that were present in ancestral species that were present in the ancestral species so that's the key here the ancestral species so let's underline ancestral species because there's the word features that were present in ancestral species and then here's the key here and remain they are still present in the descendants and remain present in all descendants. So this term, this idea of looking at um, this relationship, interpreting a relationship, you see amongst organisms many times shared ancestral characteristics. All individuals share and remain to sh uh, and continue to share an ancestral characteristic and thus we call it a shared ancestral characteristic. This is otherwise referred to as what we call remote ancestry. 
And from this idea, we can look at a very classic example of a shared uh, ancestral characteristic. There are tons of them, but let's make it relevant. Let's make it relevant to you and me by saying that the backbone is a shared ancestral characteristic because the backbone is shared by all members. So all the way back when, when the first backbone, let's say, developed, it stayed within the, the entire diversity of life and has been shared by all species. Shared by all species within the group in question, the large group in question, and that large group in question is vertebrata. In ver vertebrata. So what's going to happen is a systematist will look at vertebrata and notice, oh, there's a shared ancestral characteristics amongst all vertebrata, and that shared ancestral characteristic is the backbone. It has persisted and remained ever since its inception at the ancestral species level. So that's a shared ancestral characteristic. Another type of characteristic that gives us a good way to interpret evolutionary relationships is called a shared derived characteristic. Okay, so we're going to change it up a little bit. Shared derived characteristics. So, keyword here is derived. Here, what we state is the following. Two populations of organisms, let's say two populations of a species, uh, naturally sometimes they separate. We know that in the speciation that we've studied, that this separation happens sometimes. And once this separation happens, once we have geographical and thus reproductive isolation, we will eventually evolve independently of each other. Those two populations will evolve independently because they are no longer mixing their gene pools. The gene pools are separate and thus the evolution will be separate. And this evolution being separate will call for the fact that some homologous traits, some previously homologous traits, let's say, between these two populations that now have diverged, some homologous traits will actually no longer be those homologous traits. They will evolve into new ones, okay? Will, uh, some homologous traits evolve into, let's say, new traits that are no longer what they are were originally. We're going to have a derivation that's going to happen here. These new traits will be derived from their homologous ancestry. Furthermore, we can state that shared derived characteristics are simply those characteristics that um, uh, originates, and these characteristics originate in what we consider a recent common ancestor. So the key idea here is a recent common ancestor. The difference over here is the ancestral species versus recent common ancestor. That's a key difference between derived characteristics and ancestral characteristics. These are those present in the ancestral and staying within the all descendants. This one originates in a more recent common ancestor and present in all descendants. Present in all descendants. And of course, we're going to close this off by giving an example. I think that's the best way to understand these types of relationship interpretations. A good example is hair in mammals. Example, um, hair in mammals. So what we know for a fact is that all mammals have hair. The recent common ancestor right now is the mammal. All mammals, therefore, and all descendants of the recent mammal have hair because that's just the shared derived characteristic. But what we also know for a fact is that not all ancestors, but not all ancestors had hair. That is the definition of a shared derived characteristic. The recent common ancestor, the first mammal, let's say, developed hair, and therefore all descendants developed hair. But things that came before the mammal, let's say like not even a mammal, let's say something like a prokaryote that first developed way, way back when before a mammal, did it have hair? Of course not. Thus, we have two populations that separate and evolve independently, and then the homologous traits turn into new ones. That was a rather extreme example. I think the be a better example would be like mammals versus um, something like reptiles. Reptiles do not have hair, but mammals have hair. There was a divergence that happened. The ancestor would be the reptile, and the reptile did not have hair, and thus this is a shared derived characteristic. All mammals derive their hair from that initial mammal divergence, that initial, initial mammal independent evolution that gave the mammals hair. So that's our first ideas uh, related to interpreting relationships, and we're going to continue this discussion in the next flowchart.